Where's the science up to in that? Uh, the science is unequivocal, and the IPCC in its last uh, um, assessment report uh, said that the human influence on global warming is, is unequivocal. There is no uncertainty associated with it. New fossil fuel projects anywhere in the world are not compatible with a 1.5 degree goal. I'm Kate Lawrence, Climate Program Manager at the Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions. I'm Tanya Russell, I'm a doctoral candidate at the Australian National University. Well, we've come to Parliament House to have a look at the Senate inquiry uh, into the duty of care amendment proposed for the Climate Change Act. So the proposed amendment is to amend the Climate Change Act of 2022 to um, enshrine a duty of care towards future generations and it's also called the Intergenerational Justice Bill. And so what this is hoping to do is to actually codify in statute um, a requirement for decision makers to consider the health and well-being of current and future generations in decisions that have certain uh, environmental impacts and could pose climate change risks. So ICED's put in a submission. Uh, we covered some points that the senators today were asking about. So uh, issues on the measure at a project level of uh, impact on health and well-being. How would we do that? Um, and we've sent along uh, Emma Aisbert and Hilary Bambrick to talk about that. Um, and they've got expertise in emissions accounting, in health and epidemiology. So um, and climate change is something that, you know, obviously young, young people, children and young people and future generations are more, going to be more affected than, say, any of us in this room um, as, the, as the climate warms. To, to support her uh, comments about the focus being very narrow uh, in terms of, or very limited in terms of um, the types of decisions that may be considered under this bill, and just to, to point um, the committee towards the uh, Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales from 2015. So that's an act that actually covers all government decision making. Uh, it compels government to consider children and young people in all their decisions. They have a future generations commissioner who acts as a guardian for children and young people and future generations. And what that does is, is it actually protects health, um, health and well-being more broadly than just through whether or not you approve environmental projects. It might be, you know, thinking about, you know, it could be housing, it could be, you know, urban design, it could be any sort of policies at all that, that do have those those broader health and wellbeing impacts on children and future generations. Yeah. Uh, regarding the link between um, fossil fuel projects and uh, climate change. And of course, the International Energy Agency has made very clear, uh, this is an agency that is not renowned for being particularly pro-renewables, that new fossil fuel projects anywhere in the world are not compatible with a 1.5 degree goal. So this is you know, very clear objective analysis. I'd also like to point out for Australia's own net zero ambitions that the actual extraction process, of course fossil fuels have greenhouse gas emissions associated with their use, which for Australia is largely in other countries, but also massive amounts of emissions, are often um, mainly fugitive emissions associated with their extraction. And indeed, that's one of the fastest growing, particularly over recent decades, sources of emissions in Australia. That's significantly making it harder for us to meet our net zero ambitions, which means it's raising the cost of the rest of society of trying to make savings elsewhere to compensate. And indeed, the safeguard mechanism has been designed in a way that it does not address the expansion of fossil fuels. It's an intensity baseline. And so the safeguard mechanism does nothing to address this ever-growing uh, source of emissions that goes on our national accounts. That is that, particularly when it comes to this area of large um, fossil fuel investments, there is an extremely powerful um, legal tool that the firms have at their disposal, whether they're actually foreign or not, as Clive Palmer has so clearly showed. Uh, international investment agreements and investor state dispute settlement can be heavily weaponised against any uh, government or agency that tries to knock back um, a development of, of a mine or a gas expansion. 
Um, and so I think it's really important that that's a very one-sided legal situation currently. I think it's very important that we increase um, the sort of legal defence and the backing for the, those decision makers who are trying to do the right thing to avoid Australia being sued for another $300 billion, <laughs> for example. Um, and, and indeed, maybe balance out the scales about, about who can take um, decision makers to court. And indeed, this um, is no denying, would actually help um, those who'd like to bring cases to challenge uh, the opening of new fossil fuels. But I think that would, it's, it's really a very minor legal tool in comparison to what the big corporations have at hand. So there's quite a few groups that have spoken to give evidence um, to the hearing this morning. We have been able to see the Youth Climate uh, Coalition and um, aligned groups um, present their views and they were extremely compelling. We've also been able to hear um, Director of ICETS, um, Professor Mark Howden, um, speaking on behalf of his submission to ATSI, talking about the social cost of carbon and also the underpinning um, rationale for why we need this bill. What the, the evidence is and the science shows is that uh, accumulations of greenhouse gases are already significantly increasing uh, risks uh, to physical health and mental health for young people across the globe, and that's unevenly spread. So some places are affected more than others, and some groups are affected more than others. So those people who are already suffering from poverty and gender in, uh, issues or other um, stresses in their lives tend to be more impacted than others. Uh, what we can see from the science <clears throat> is our current trajectories of greenhouse gas emissions, which are being pushed up by those sorts of large projects that you refer to, uh, are going to increase uh, temperatures across the globe. They are going to increase extreme events, uh, and those are going to impact on young people as they grow up. And there's increasing evidence of both the physical and mental impacts, both acute and chronic mental imp health impacts on young people from climate changes as well as on issues such as domestic violence, which is linked to temperature. And we've seen recent studies which show those linkages. Mm -hmm. So if we were looking to argue from a point of equity and justice for those people who currently have a voice in the political system, the voters, as well as those people who don't have a voice in the political system, which is the young people, uh, we would actually be incorporating their views. Mm -hmm. uh, the science is unequivocal, and the IPCC in its last uh, um, assessment report uh, said that the human influence on global warming is, is unequivocal. There is no uncertainty associated with that. We can't explain the warming we've observed without including the human influence on greenhouse gas emissions and other factors such as land clearing. So in that sense, the science is uh, you know, very robust. Um, we can also see uh, analyses which look at things like the social cost of carbon. So that's the accumulated costs and benefits, so the net costs and benefits of emitting a tonne of carbon. And uh, the US EPA just recently uh, redid uh, their assessments uh, for the purposes of inclusion in the US uh, system, the government system over there. And you know, it varies depending on discount rates and timing, but roughly speaking, 300 US dollars a tonne of, uh, per car, you know, for a tonne of carbon dioxide emitted. Uh, there's been recent uh, studies uh, which, um, whilst they have a wide range, the, the median number for that was 417 US dollars a tonne, so I think 600 Australian dollars uh, for each tonne of carbon. And that's because the benefits from emitting that tonne of carbon are grossly outweighed by the costs, and those costs include um, things like impacts on young people. So just, just, um, just to clarify on, on that, you're saying that they're saying that the cost of emitting a tonne of carbon is in the range of 300 to 400, 400 US dollars a tonne. Ton. That's right, yeah. And so the way those uh, analyses look at is that they look at, at, at a global scale because if every tonne of carbon eventually gets spread around the globe, so you have to look at it from a global scale. Uh, and uh, you add up all of the positives uh, that might occur, you know, so you know, warmer conditions which can increase growing length of growing seasons, say in Scandinavia, against the negatives, such as uh, increased health burden on people in the equatorial regions. Mm -hmm. And you do that over a period of time, and then you add up all of those numbers and you come up with a net cost. 
And, and the fact that it is so grossly negative in the sense that there's a cost of carbon tells you something about how our approaches are um, asymmetrical in terms of considering immediate benefit from emitting carbon versus the long-term cost.